Okay, welcome again. So here is a very short um, review of whatever happened in this class with the view of, uh, you know, emphasizing a little what is important and how things connect to each other uh, so that you can perhaps prepare better for the exams. But the thing is the following, that with the examinations, that of course we have, this time we have an online examination, other times we have a physical, you know, examination in person. So these are different because ours will be a closed book examination, an open book examination, right? You have access to all these things, uh, to all these uh, files, while uh, other times it is a closed book examination where you have to memorize everything. And obviously the question types are different. Also, I can emphasize what is the most important thing, um, but this is not necessarily what I will be asking you, because if I asked only the most important things, then you would have to learn only those, and these would be the same every term, and so everybody every term would get an A. So we have to, I have to make sure that I ask you questions that are sufficiently difficult and unexpected also, right? So I also have to ask you some things that you don't expect and some things that are not obviously the most important, right? Some things that are difficult and uh, specialized knowledge that not everybody will have. So al although the exam is fair, I ask you only things that are in the lecture notes uh, and explained well and that we have talked about. Uh, still, I, I have to sometimes to ask you things that are a little less uh, important in order to get a distinction between students who know these things and students who don't know them, right? Okay, so this was the introduction to this session. So now briefly uh, I will go through the whole thing, which you know I cannot do in detail. Uh, you have all the other videos. I will just mention a few things. I hope half an hour will be enough to do this. Okay, so the introduction doesn't contain anything of importance. I'm just going through the lecture notes now. Um, we had examples of AI and philosophical issues, um, examples of applied systems. We talked about um, chess, about the Tesla autopilot, how face recognition works, what IBM Watson did. We talked about AlphaGo. We talked about Asimo and Ibo and Pepper and other robotics videos. And finally, we talked about philosophical issues. So let's stop here for a second. These examples, um, the cars and the chess playing and the go playing and all these things, these you must know because these are not only important for, you know, everyday talk about AI. You need to know what happened in AI in the past 10 years, but also these are important as examples for questions. So if I ask you a question in the exam, you know, how do you evaluate some thing that relates, you know, to computer uh, game playing, for example, you need to know about AlphaGo, right? Uh, if I ask you, um, uh, how do you judge, you know, um, war robots on the battlefield, you need to know what war robots are, and you need to know what kinds exist, and so on. So these are some things that you need to know, you need to know these examples, because these are all examples for important concepts for important developments and um, everybody who is acquainted with artificial intelligence should know these examples okay um, now these philosophical questions here uh, of course this is important because this is the way to think about things right to, to take one of these technologies and to try thinking what is the morally relevant bit about the technology. Why is it good or why would it be bad or why would people be upset about it? And there are always roughly the same problems, right? One is the fear that robots might take our jobs. One is the fear of uh, surveillance. One is the fear of what will they do to our society? What will they do to the education of our children? Is the effect good? Is the effect bad? With self-driving cars, what happens if self-driving cars kill people? Um, so all these, you know, problems that are common and they are easy to, to think about, they are easy to uh, research also using Google. But you should have some some estimation of, of what the problems are and some, some feeling for that. So an exam question might be, for example, you know, what are the problems that IBM Watson poses 
and how can we deal with them or something like this okay um so i put some results here and we don't need to talk about it again okay um then we talked about the history and claims of ai this is a more um theoretical chapter but you need to know these little bits of history is not much right we talked about aristotle we talked about Alan Turing uh, is very important, and don't confuse the Turing machine and the Turing test, right? These are totally different things, both called after Turing, but they are different. The Turing test obviously is a major thing in AI, you need to know about it. This program, S-H-R-D-L-U, however you pronounce that, um, Terry Winograd's uh, program that understands language is an important milestone in AI. Searle's Chinese room is also an important criticism of the Turing test, right? And then you need to know about neurons and artificial neural networks, uh, very roughly, what the idea is. At, at this stage, later you need to know more. Uh, and some applications like image style transfer, uh, you need to know about evolutionary computing, Moore's law, and that's it for this historical introduction. Then we talk about the claims of AI. Um, what does AI actually want? And so we have this idea we, we want to create artificial humans perhaps or not. You should know why not. You should know the claim of strong AI, the claim of weak AI. Uh, you should know about the distinctions between psychological and phenomenal concepts of mind because this is essentially what is at stake when we talk about um, strong and weak AI, right? It's, it's about this question, um, the phenomenal and the psychological concepts of mind. Uh, how does AI and the philosophy of mind relate to each other? We Again, this we talk about later also when we talk about the philosophy of mind. Um, and um, some criticisms of these concepts. Okay, that's it. So not much here. Uh, then we have definitions of AI and how to detect intelligence. Now this is important because this um, emphasizes this and it builds upon this distinction between strong and weak AI. And then we have different ways of detecting intelligence. This also reaches into the core of the Turing test, right, and the Chinese room argument. So there are various ways of detecting intelligence. Uh, we said we have the structural equivalence, the behavioral equivalence, which is a Turing test essentially and we have the functional equivalence which would be something different something stronger um, you need to be able to distinguish these things from each other what is the functional uh, equivalence how is it different from the structural or from the behavioral equivalence and then you need to be able to criticize these theses so what what are the problems of the structural equivalence thesis uh, what are the problems of the behavioral equivalence thesis and so on um, again, all these are discussed later in more detail, so these are in the philosophy of mind chapter, right? You might want to go there, and the Chinese nation argument also. You might want to go there and read about them in detail. Uh, this is a part of the thing with this course. You have perhaps noticed that we always repeat things, so, so everything appears multiple times, um, and the idea is that first it appears in a very rough form, and, and you hear it for the first time, and later you hear more detail about it, later you hear more detail about it, and in this way things become more um, familiar, because you've heard them many times, rather than giving you one lecture out of the blue that talks only about the Chinese nation argument and, and functionalism, um, and, and you hear this for the first time, then it's difficult to grasp, right? But if you get used to these terms by hearing them multiple times, then by the time we get to the most detailed treatment of it, you have already heard about it multiple times and you had some opportunity to digest it, right? So this is why uh, things repeat again and again, right? So don't worry about this as a feature uh, rather than a problem, right? Okay, different definitions of AI. Um, this is just a, a game in, you know, trying to understand how a definition can be bad. Um, and some, some of them are too broad, all of them are too broad, right? Some of them are too narrow, perhaps. So we need to see what are the problems are of these definitions. It's, it's all, uh, the criticism is all down there. Uh, so it's not a problem, right, to uh, understand this, I hope. If you have some basic idea about how to make a definition, <coughs> critical thinking, then 
um, you will be able to easily judge these definitions. Okay, so now we are in session five already. Prologue, symbols and meaning. So now it starts to get technical. So we begin, you know, in the beginning we have this historical overview. This is the idea of the whole course. Later we have the symbolic AI, which is what we are doing now. Then we will be doing sub-symbolic AI. Then we will be doing some philosophy of mind. And in the end we do applications. So this is the whole structure. So now we are at the second part. We talk about symbolic AI. Um, and we use Prolog as an example. Prolog is a great example. It's not uh, used very much in actual AI today. It was used in, in the past. Uh, it is not so much today, but the structure of the language is very good in order to show it can be easily understood, even if you don't know computer programming. And it is a good example for many things. For example, the, the Turing test. Uh, the criticism of the Turing test in the Chinese room, you can understand what the point is of the Chinese room by looking at a prologue program, right? And so this is why uh, this is a good language for our purpose, although it's perhaps not the most used one. So you don't need to know prologue, but you need to understand how these prologue predicates work. And if I give you a bit of prologue, a very easy bit like something like that, you should be able to understand what it's saying and, and how it's working internally and what the prologue program actually understands and what it doesn't understand. <clears throat> so um, here are some examples of prologue. Then we have some more complicated examples. Uh, and here is the you know, mapping of symbols to meaning, which is one of the central things of AI. This appears again and again. Mapping of symbols to meaning is the problem we have with the Chinese room. It is the problem that uh, Brooks tries to solve with the subsumption architecture. It is the problem that is the main criticism of symbolic AI. It is the problem that is at the root of subsymbolic AI, where subsymbolic AI tries to solve that. It is the robot reply to the Chinese room argument in here. Uh, it has to do with uh, responsibility ascription. It has to do with common sense. Psych is uh, the whole psych project falls or you know survives depending on how exactly you answer this question. So the the relationship between symbol and meaning is a very important is a central question for the whole of AI, right? And the philosophy of mind also, right? And you need to understand this. Okay. So here we have various examples of prolog. Uh, as I said, it's not a prolog course, right? So you don't need to be able to write correct prolog, but you should be able to understand how these things work. Uh, let's walk, go on. Uh, from prolog, we see that we have these two predicates, is, a, and has, and from this we come to the idea of ontology. And the ontology is, again, what is at the basis of psych, this ontology of everyday knowledge. And we also see the limits of it, the limits of Aristotelian logic, two-valued logic. And from this, we can conclude that perhaps we need some more complicated kind of logic, some more um, flexible kind of logic. And we come to this idea of the defeasible assumptions, uh, which are assumptions that I make, but the, I'm, I'm, they may not be true. Uh, they are true most of the time, or I have a good reason to believe that they are true, but they are not true in the logical sense. Okay, from here on, we go to the expert systems um, chapter, which is again at the core of symbolic AI expert systems. These are the most useful uh, pieces of symbolic AI that have been produced uh, in history. They are still part of um, um, medical applications are based on expert systems often or diagnostic applications in cars, for example, uh, and also um, the criticism of symbolic AI has often been directed towards expert systems. And of course, psych is, in a sense, just a big expert system. So expert systems is a, is a very uh, central bit of what AI is supposed to be doing, uh, particularly symbolic AI, right? And uh, now we come to the physical symbol system hypothesis. It's a hypothesis, you know, that I can construct a um, thinking and intelligent machine uh, by just manipulating symbols. Um, 
And now we come to a criticism of symbolic AI, right? What are the problems of symbolic AI? One is the frame problem. Uh, is very popular, very, very prominent. You need to understand that, among philosophers particularly. Um, and it's also, yeah, and then we, now we come to the expert system. So this was just an introduction to the problems of symbolic AI. Now the expert systems, what is an expert system is explained in this graphic. Make sure you understand this and its components. Uh, and the architecture, what belongs to an expert system, uh, what people are involved, what, what kinds of professions and, and interactions are involved in creating an expert system. And then, of course, one of the biggest, most prominent bits of criticism of symbolic AI, Hubert Dreyfus' criticism of expert systems. Uh, and you need to know a little about Hubert Dreyfus, well, who he is and what he said. And then this argument, uh, how uh, does an expert work and how does an AI system work and how are they different? And so this, you don't need all the steps one by one, right? But you need to understand the rough stages from the novice to the advanced stage to the competent stage um, and then over to the expert uh, stage, proficient stage, right? And then finally the expert stage. And you need to understand how this is supposed to work and to give an example, take, you know, driving, car driving or chess playing or handwriting, whatever you want. Uh, it doesn't matter, right? All, all these examples work the same. Um, but make sure you can explain this with an example. And then uh, the conclusion from it is here. So make sure you understand the conclusion to understand what the criticism is. And we have an extension of this. Not only is our expert systems bad, but also calculative rationality. This is some things where, where Vinograd and Trefus agree, right? The, the role of calculative rationality in society. This has been criticized by other people also. Um, it's based on, on the Heideggerian idea at the basis of it um, that making everything countable and making everything, you know, into attributes uh, and properties of things uh, is a bad thing. Um, and why is it a bad thing? Because it does not uh, value our genuine human interaction with things, right? Our engagement with the world, uh, which provides this sort of special expertise, which is not algorithmic, right? And we have this example of the ballistics expert. This is an important example with a court case to just show you um, how this leads to, um, to a reduction of, of expertise in society and makes society actually worse. Um, and the same with the creating of, of uh, furniture and so on, all this machinery that produces as a result, a lack of expertise in humans. Um, and this, is, an, this is, is important, and this is an important criticism of the whole project, not only of AI, but of technology in general, right? So you should be aware of this criticism. Um, there are solutions to the problem, of course, uh, which are discussed here. Okay, so then we come to Psych. Psych is the an, an extension, you could say, of, of uh, expert systems. A very, very big expert system, uh, very nicely constructed, very well built with uh, lots of thought and uh, uh, tons of work. Uh, it's the, the king of expert systems, right? Instead of being limited to one domain, Psych aims to be an expert in all of human knowledge. And uh, so, but this is based on, on ideas about what common sense is and what common sense computing is. And so first, of course, you have to try to understand what common sense is, which is discussed here. Uh, and uh, uh, later you have to see that there is not one common sense, right? Uh, what is involved in common sense? And then it becomes more and more difficult if you think about common sense. It's not as common uh, or sensible as you would think. So you have to understand what it means to raise a machine with a human-like common sense and how would it even acquire this human-like common sense? What is machine-like common sense? And then finally, what is Psyche trying to do? Uh, Psyche, we need to understand a little about the technology behind it. What, How does the Psyche language work? Um, and some more examples here of the side language. What psych would be good for, right? What is the advantage of it? What's the, what is a micro theory? Um, 
yeah, and here are the advantages and, and some practical successes of Psyche, um, but also some criticism of the Psyche project, right? This is what we also need to be aware of. So, again, the question whether Psyche contains meaning is essentially the same questions that the Chinese room argument is asking, right? Um, so these things repeat again and again, right? They're the same motifs. If you have, whenever you have symbolic AI, the criticism will always be the symbol doesn't have meaning. It's the same as in Prolog, what we said before. It's the same as in uh, Psyche. It's the same um, as in the Chinese room, right? All these are connected. And now we come to chatbots. We see one application here. Um, it's not in the applications because it's more a part of symbolic AI. So here's a little uh, more technical history about talking machines. The Leibniz Prize, which is a Turing test um, uh, instantiation. Uh, we have AIML and Alice, which again is not today very important, but it is historically one of the uh, first ways that people try to make a Turing test, uh, to beat the Turing test. Um, and we can learn something from it about beating uh, humans, humans in the Turing test, right? Uh, then we have Recta, another historical program with a huge influence um, uh, because it shows us this, this whole problem of not processing meaning, but not processing meaning in a very clever way, so that it suggests that it has abilities that it does not have. Uh, and this is a problem uh, that, that reaches up to the present. The Tesla autopilot suggests that it has abilities that it doesn't have. And this leads people to use it wrongly, to, to rely on it and then crash their cars. Uh, so this is essentially the same problem that is exhibited here. Um, so what we can learn from Rekta and Random Poems um, is here. Um, this is important, try to, to understand this. Is, these are important motives uh, in all of human-robot interactions, right? Uh, then we have Google Duplex, uh, which is a stunning um, attempt to simulate human voice. We have Microsoft Tay, which was um, totally failed. And again, all these are examples that you need later in order to make your arguments. Nobody can argue about a topic like AI uh, if one doesn't know any AI, right? So you need to have some examples to, to give some meat to your arguments. And you should remember these cases. These are the most prominent examples, right? Google Duplex, Microsoft Tay, these are the things people are talking about. Then we talk about Markov chains, another uh, technical topic, but we do it, of course, without any mathematics. So if you wanted to, to actually do the calculation, it would involve some uh, statistics here. Uh, in this case, we don't need any mathematics, but we need uh, to understand the principle of it, uh, how you calculate these chains of probabilities. And you can try it out, demonstrations. Generally, you know, you should try these demonstrations out. I always put links into the lecture notes. Um, the, um, the thing is not to become an expert in anything, but to avoid having only a theoretical knowledge by memorizing the lecture notes. This is not what gives you an appreciation of AI, right? You should, if you want to understand AI, because AI is such a living thing. If you if you do Latin grammar, then perhaps, you know, the only thing you have are books of, of Latin grammar. But AI is everywhere. It's all around us. So it is really a waste to say, uh, I will just learn the lecture notes when the world is full of these very uh, interesting and, and living, moving, you know, technologies. So you should go out, you should click on things, you should go to the internet, and you should experience AI, right, instead of just learning about it. Um, so this is why I give you all these examples. Click on them, go on them, um, experiment, play with them. So Markov chains... Um, and templating, templating approaches, you know, to creating language, how they're different. And then finally, we have this paper um, about challenges and opportunities of social chatbots. Uh, this is an interesting paper because it gives you a little more history about chatbots and it explains uh, some of the main problems and some of the architectures also that are used. So you need to know something about Eliza, uh, Alice, you know already, and... Uh, then you need to see what the structure of such a system is. It's here, right, roughly, uh, and what the different parts do. 
and what uh, social chat books exist and what um, intelligence assistants exist and what they are doing and how to design them well, right? What would be a good design for an intelligent assistant and what would not be a good design? Uh, so these are things that you can see uh, from these examples, right? What do you think about this response and that response? You should have some some sense of, of when these are successful and when they are not successful. Okay, from this more practical uh, chapter about chatbots, now we go back to to a little more philosophy, Turing test in Chinese room. Um, you have all these arguments, right? Criticism of the Turing test. Um, we won't go into details now. Perthes battle of wits is an important argument. The French, the whole block of arguments of French, which is the subcognitive processes and the island where there are only seagulls and uh, the rating games and so on, right? So these are all important arguments against the Turing test. Uh, people have tried to escape the criticism of the Turing test by proposing variants. They are an endless number. We I only give you one example. Here is the Kugel test, and I think that's enough. Uh, but you will occasionally, if you read the literature, see that there are many other such uh, arguments and um, you can evaluate them yourself in similar ways, right, by thinking about them. So then we have the Chinese room argument. Uh, you don't need to remember, of course, to memorize all the so, uh, text here. I'll just give it to you to, to see it more precisely how it is formulated. But um, <coughs> you need to only remember the rough <coughs> idea of it. And, and the replies now. There is, and there are many replies again. There are, there are dozens of replies, but they are, you know, uh, two are the main uh, replies. One is the system reply and one is the robot reply. And you need to be able to understand both of them um, and to be able to criticize them also, the replies. <coughs> <coughs> like with everything in philosophy, there's an argument, <coughs> there's a counter-argument, and then there's a counter-counter-argument to the counter-argument. So this is what happens here. We have the counter-argument to the robotic symbol grounding reply to the original argument. <clears throat> okay, and the reply to that argument. And so um, this brings up a more general question. What's the relationship between robots and cognition, between embodiment and cognition? Do you need to have a body in order to have cognition? <coughs> Again, a very central point in AI, what's the relationship between intelligence and embodiment? And this is another central question of these, you know, questions, big questions, because this appears again and again. It appears in the here, in this um, robot reply. It appears as a criticism of psych. It appears as a criticism of pure symbolic AI. Uh, it appears in Dreyfus criticism. Because if you had a body, then perhaps you would escape much of Dreyfus' criticism um, or, or Vinograd's criticism. Um, it appears in philosophy a lot about how is the, the import, the, the, what is the importance of embodiment to intelligence. It, it appears in the discussions about transhumanism, where you have the question, can I re re remove my intelligence? Can I copy it into a computer and then... Um, the computer will will have my intelligence. Is this even possible? Or am I my body in more senses than just, you know, um, uh, my intelligence? And then it also then has to do, of course, with um, um, with the um, a philosophy of mind. You know, what is the mind? How How much of the mind is embodied? And this, again, has to do with extended mind theory, which talks about um, that the environment, you know, is part of our mental faculties. And if this is the case, then we perhaps have a problem with responsibility ascription because a classical Kantian autonomy responsibility concept uh, does not take the embodiment into account or the extendedness of mental states. So these are, again, all related to each other and you need to understand these connections. And, and that's the whole fun, right? To understand how this is all connected. For for people who have not taken this course, these are all different things. For you now, this this should start to become one big area where you see how the different parts fit together, right? <coughs> okay. 
from that we move on uh, to sub-symbolic AI. So now we leave symbolic AI, Let's talk about sub-symbolic AI, with symbolic uh, you know, intelligence without representation, which is the title of a Brooks paper. And we start with Breitenberg vehicles, which are the best examples of sub-symbolic AI, the easiest to understand, where you have sensors and motors that are connected and move to the right and to the left. They're easy enough to be able to, with your mind, you know, predict what they will do without any other hardware or taking notes or anything. <clears throat> but you can make them so complex that you can actually try to derive some conclusions about embodiment and intelligence from them. <clears throat> And Brooks did this. So the, the subsumption architecture robots from of Brooks are essentially big, complex Breitenberg vehicles. Um, and then you can see how far this goes, right? How well this works in practice. Um, it turns out some things work surprisingly well, some things work surprisingly badly. Uh, for example, you remember one problem of these uh, subsumption robots was that uh, they couldn't find the door to go back uh, without any mental representation uh, of the room, symbolic representation of the room. And so they had to, you know, randomly run around in order to find the door, or you had to arrange all the doors to go in north-south direction so that the robot can find the way back. Uh, this is obviously not useful. So for these uh, uh, cases, you would need some symbolic representation. And this is why we are built like this, right? We humans have both symbolic and sub-symbolic components. And our symbolic component, you know, our, our thinking brain does exactly that. It, it helps us remember where the door is. So <clears throat> like, like often in life, you know, the extremes are not the best. Uh, some combination of the extremes uh, is in the middle, you know, is what is probably the sensible solution. Okay, so the graceful degradation, you need to remember what this is. You need to be able to explain why that's a good thing. And then with uh, novel AI, you know, new AI and how this relates to good old fashioned AI um, and what the importance of novel AI is. And from this now, from what Brooks was calling novel AI, now we come to neural networks, which is the newest kind of AI, also sub-symbolic. Uh, but now largely the symbolic part is absent, so we have only a neural network controlling things. For this to understand this, you need to understand what a neuron is, what a neural network is, how these things work. We have a beautiful example with tables here. You should use it. You should use these uh, tables to understand the spreadsheets to understand how neurons work. Make sure you understand these examples here um, because this is how it works. And, and if you don't understand what's happening here, you won't understand uh, many of the more important points later. Because the whole responsibility thing uh, for decisions of neural networks hangs on this. You know, this is why we cannot be responsible for what a self-driving car does, because what we can see is 0 0.6 or 1.1. And this is why it doesn't work to give a symbolic interpretation to a neural network. And this is why you cannot be responsible for its actions, in a simple way, at least. So in order to understand all the responsibility ascription problems later, you need to understand how these things are built. Make sure you understand that um, and the differences to symbolic AI. <laughs> so now how neural networks learn, of course, backpropagation, generalization. These are all very important topics, especially today where the world is full of neural networks uh, that do exactly that. Uh, you need to understand it. This is what your phone does in many instances. This is what your car does. <coughs> this is what the camera that is watching you does, right, um, in the city. <coughs> surveillance cameras. <clears throat> um, okay, you need to dis understand a little what the problems are with configuring neural networks. Do we want to make them big or small? This again is very important um, because again with uh, with the social implications, overfitting is important because overfitting is, it sounds like a minor technical problem, but it is what created Google. It is what creates uh, Apple and Facebook and what makes them to, to the biggest AI companies. Because if I try to recognize uh, a cylindrical object and I have only this and that, I'm going to overfit my model. It will just remember these things 
uh, these particular things and not be able to generalize. If I want my uh, neural network to be able to generalize, I have to show it thousands of bottles, millions of pictures of bottles. Where do I get millions of people's of, uh, pictures of bottles? I don't get them, and this is why I'm not Google, and this is why Google can do that. Right? This is why Facebook offers you free storage of your pictures, because they want the millions of pictures of bottles. Right? So this is very important to understand because, again, this is related to very practical um, points later. Right? <clears throat> so various examples of neural networks, uh, reinforcement learning, another point where it's very important to understand how it works because this has to do with the responsibility ascription. Now, we go more away from that into practical applications now. So one application is generative adversarial networks. We talked about this, how to generate faces, which faces are uh, genuine, which are not, which are created, ways how to distinguish it. You should know because these are things that, that you will see in the future more and more. Um, what's the connection between AI and social networks? This I just talked about, right? Um, the need for data big data companies, <coughs> and finally failures of neural networks are a very important topic again because uh, this is, these are the biggest failure uh, causes of IT systems that we have now and that we will have in the near future. And when something breaks with Tesla cars or with, um, with, with um, face recognition and so on, it will break because of these things. And these are the adversarial examples are what, what terrorists will use. It is also what uh, freedom fighters will use to get, you know, surveillance cameras confused uh, in, in dictatorships. It is, um, it is very important for your practical, for your life, for your practical life, for your political life to understand adversarial examples. It's not one technological bit that you can forget about. It's the main cause of failure of AI now and for the foreseeable future. Um, so misidentification of faces and um, <coughs> uh, misclassifications, for example, of traffic signs, right? We saw various examples here, traffic sign manipulation, uh, bananas and toasters and so on. So these are all very important. Go back, make sure you understand all these attacks. And then we have some tutorial questions about neural networks. Uh, make sure you can answer all of those. These are crafted, these questions, to exactly uh, ask about the points that most students don't get the first time around. So make sure that you understand all these questions and the answers to them that are in the lecture notes. Okay, so here we are. Um, machine learning, genetic computing. Here you have some terminology of machine learning that is important because you find it in the news. Regression, classification, clustering. This is your first step into understanding machine learning. It's not yet enough to really understand how it works, but it is enough to at least have an idea when machine learning people talk, <coughs> you will know what they're talking about. Um, and if you want to proceed there, you know, and learn the mathematics of these things, you can, of course, go on and do it. Genetic computing, you need to understand a little bit about evolution, um, not much. What you know from school is enough, but you have to make sure that you still know it. And then finally, um, all these consequences of genetic algorithms and so on. So now we are finished with um, sub-symbolic AI. And now we come into the third part. Now we talk a little about the mind, and then we talk about applications. So first, the mind, the main theories in the philosophy of mind and how they affect AI is an important uh, point again. Mental states, mind, is it the same like the mind and the body? Are these different things? And this also connects with the whole question of uh, embodiment uh, and with the whole question of extended minds and for the, with the whole question who is responsible for an action. And with the whole question, should machines have rights? Can I enslave a machine? Can I misuse a machine? Can I torture a machine? This all depends on how I answer these questions. So again, very important to get these answers right and to understand the philosophy of mind. Mary's room is very important. Mary's room answers the question, tries to answer the question, you know, is everything physical? Uh, is there consciousness? Uh, what is consciousness? Uh, so Mary's room, qualia, you, you have to uh, remember the Mary's room argument if you want to talk about AI. 
Um, then we come talk to functionalism. So functionalism is the most um, prominent and the most loved uh, philosophy of mind theory among AI practitioners because it's the only one that really works well with AI. And uh, but it has some traps, right? It has the physical realizability trap. It has the uh, question of um, the, the arguments, you know, particularly the Chinese nation argument against functionalism, which you need to find some answer to. You cannot ignore this argument, right? If you want to do AI, you need to have a position regarding the China brain. Okay, functionalism in AI, again, uh, more details about that. Make sure you learn this because functionalism is from all the, philo the philosophies of mind the, the most um, prominent and most used um, in AI. From here we come to the extended mind, where now we start to see the implications of these things. So we, we learned all this theory and now we go to the practical implications. And with the extended mind you see um, that we connect a theory of mind with a theory of responsibility. And we come to the idea of a hybrid uh, agent that acts together, the, the person and the environment act together and a goal translation happens. And so by designing the artifact, I um, create particular artifacts where the human might be in a disadvantaged position uh, compared with a machine. This has great implications for responsibility again. Um, and uh, I give you a few examples, self-driving cars and the Boeing control system, flight control system, and the responsibility problems that arise from these, right? So these are very important things about the practical responsibility of AI. Then we talk about cyborgs. Uh, cyborgs, you know, the, the simplest thing is a little worm, which we can completely map in these neurons and simulate on a computer. More complicated would be cases where humans are involved in cyborgs. Um, in the, again, there the easiest is wearing glasses, for example, like I do, is a kind of cyborg. Uh, but this becomes more difficult when you have brain implants that gives you new features. Uh, do you then get new values? Do you get new uh, more a uh, new cyborg morality? Um, a human or the question of human autonomy, right? What happens if you are a cyborg? Do you also get rid of parts of your autonomy? This again connects with the extended mind. The extended mind and the mental cyborg are very similar uh, concepts, and they are they are very much connected to each other in terms of their. Um, <clears throat> consequences. So you should know about brain-controlled machines. This is also very important practically in medicine nowadays. Uh, you have brain uh, computer interfaces where you can control uh, wheelchairs, for example, with your thought, which is very important for some people who cannot move anything else, uh, uh, any limbs, right? But they can control a wheelchair with their brain. Um, but uh, these things create enormous problems, right, for society. Also in the future, you know, uh, is, is there an, an, a, a right to be enhanced? Do children have a right uh, to, or, or does the state have a right to demand that you enhance your children, for example, as we do with vaccinations in some countries? Uh, so this you need to know, uh, you need to have an idea about the moral problems um, that come from cyborgs and human enhancement. And there's a lot of discussion here based on this uh, paper um, which I have given you, uh, uh, which distinguishes, you know, these different moral problems. And uh, from there now we go into a collection of various bits and pieces uh, where I will only briefly mention the headlines. Uh, so we talk about the ethics of self-driving cars. We have the MIT moral machine. Uh, first, some moral theory you will need to discuss these things, right? Normally we use utilitarianism, Kant, social contract, virtue ethics. And uh, MIT Moral Machine gives you little problems, little cases where you can um, discuss these cases then using moral theories. Uh, this is explained here. Make sure you have an idea about moral theories. Make sure you have an idea about how to deal with such a MIT Moral Machine case. This is important also because this, this is the whole discussion about self-driving cars is based essentially on the same ideas like this one. Um, okay, there's some criticism of this. 
Then we talk about emotional machines and loving machines. Uh, you have lots of sources here. What is an emotion? Um, and uh, with emotional machines and loving machines, we would also talk about, you know, what is love and what is uh, sex and, and is sex bad? Is sex with a machine bad or is it worse than sex with a human? Uh, what if um, sexual practices involve uh, exploitation of humans, which they often do? Is it then better to exploit a machine than to exploit a human? So these are all uh, very interesting questions. Relational agents, how do, do machines and robots relate to humans, right? And some problems of loving machines. Uh, in raising children and so on. A very, com a very, very um, important thing is the uncanny valley, which you need to remember um, how um, machines become, you know, uh, strange or, or uh, unpleasant uh, when they look close to humans but not quite human. So this is another important thing, the degradation of love, uh, the social isolation problem. So all kinds of problems having to do with machines. And robot prostitution, of course. Is this moral or is it not moral? Does it demean women? Uh, and there are various papers we have read and various uh, discussions. So I think we can, We I will stop here now. And perhaps um, there, there is more. Look at the, your lecture notes. There is more. But these things change from, from semester to semester. And this semester we didn't have much. So I don't want now to talk about things that we did not talk about. So I will stop here and, and the other application topics you will find uh, when you go back uh, to um, the detailed lecture notes. So this is just the, the very rough overview so that you have an idea how this whole thing hangs together. Okay, so we are finished. Thank you and hope to see you uh, next term or next year. Uh, I have other classes, um, philosophy of Love and sexuality is one. Um, philosophy of happiness is another. Um, so you're welcome to come to these classes and have more of that, if you like that. And a future of mankind also, right? The future of mankind I have next term. And this is also a very um, funny and interesting class, right? Where we talk about what will happen to mankind in the near future and in the far future. Likely. Okay, so finishing this up, um, our review, we come to AI and jobs is another chapter we talked about. Uh, the, the influence of artificial intelligence on the job market um, and the future of uh, work. Um, so first uh, here um, we have this overview of the different points that, that are uh, under discussion. Uh, this is a very nice chart that gives you um, a general idea about what is involved here. Um, and uh, I think I've here I've written it in, in a list. So you have uh, specific applications of AI and what AI will be able to do in the future, a kind of forecast right, of AI capabilities. <coughs> developments in computer science. So this is again why you have to learn all the theory in the beginning, right, about symbolic AI and about psych and about neural networks, because without this knowledge, you are not able to understand how computer science is likely to proceed and what kinds of things computer science is likely to develop, right? You're not going to understand this if you have no idea. Um, uh, how things work. So you need to know some computer science on a very general level. You don't need to understand how it works in, in detail, but you need to understand what is it doing? What are the results of computer science, right? In the same way like you need to understand some physics in order to be able to understand why um, nuclear power plants are dangerous. Um, I mean, if you have no idea of, of what an atom is and, and what nuclear power is, uh, then you cannot understand and you cannot decide as a citizens whether these things are good for you or not. So again, the, um, the basics are important in order to understand what's happening here. So then we have the um, impact of AI on work is another chapter, you know, how, how do I uh, analyze the social and economic impact of AI and the social consequences, um, what will happen if, if we lose work, um, what will be the impact of automation on workers, uh, and also, you know, psychological consequences. The work is a source of meaning. 
And finally, how can we regulate all this as a society? So we say perhaps we want to, as a society, we want to uh, make laws about AI. So what kinds of laws can we make? What kinds of laws are necessary? What kinds of laws are likely to work and, and what are not likely to work? Uh, these are things we discuss there. So um, here you need to know a little about applications um, and especially the fact that um, AI uh, systems are not likely to replace only workers, but they are likely to replace much more uh, white collar jobs uh, e equally, right? Um, for example, doctors. And uh, we have some examples here of automation uh, more generally, not, not AI, but automation, which has been going on for uh, 150, 200 years. Uh, and you see how uh, th how machines have replaced people. But this automation goes more and more into the area of replacing humans where specifically human qualities are necessary, um, uh, intellectual, uh, mental qualities, uh, like, for example, processing and order, as you see here. Um, and then we have all these area of industrial robots, which uh, replace people in factories and do the hard work. But actually, as we see here, they don't uh, threaten jobs that much. Um, and uh, so then you have a distinction between automation in the traditional sense, including industrial, some industrial robots and autonomous robots. Uh, and what is new with AI, right? So this is, you need to understand this distinction. What is new um, in AI, which means what is new since deep learning, essentially, uh, and what was automation already since, since in principle, ancient times, right? Asian, ancient Greeks already had um, windmills uh, or water mills, which is a kind of automation, right? So you need to understand traditional automation as opposed to artificial intelligence-based automation. Then some uh, forecast of future AI capabilities. Uh, again, you need to get a feeling for what is likely to happen and, and which machines uh, are likely to be constructed, what things are easy to build, what things are hard to build. Uh, you can get an idea by looking at uh, papers, a uh, number of papers on artificial intelligence. Uh, and then you we get on the positive side some benefits from automation. You need to be able to say what is the good thing about automation, right? For example, in driving. So now uh, when we talk about the impact of AI on work, of course, then we have a general economic analysis on impact uh, of AI on work and jobs lost. And you see that different jobs are lost to different percentages. Uh, particular skills are easier to replace by machines than other skills. Um, this is very hard to read, but if you have the PDF file, you can zoom in here uh, and you will see that this actually is a um, full resolution um, uh, graphic that you can zoom in and, and actually read on your screen, right? And sorry that it doesn't work to show it in, in full resolution in this um, video. So then we uh, have this try to try to an, to analyze jobs to group jobs into creative jobs and interaction rich or interaction poor jobs and so you have this creative interaction scale on two uh, axes um, which gives you some idea uh, then we have a loss of quality due to automation which is in line what Dreyfus said previously right so try to to remember Dreyfus um, this is an important uh, comment now back on this idea that we lose expertise as a society. Um, go back to the Dreyfus chapter to see that argument. And uh, the, finally, I mean, nothing is really clear when you talk about the future, right? Obviously, um, the future has this um, property of not being known. Uh, and therefore, all these predictions must be taken with some um, uh, grain of salt, right? So the social consequences now are um, d distinct and go further than just the economic consequences um, because you have the impact of automation on workers. Right? Workers are people. It's not only you know a number, but it has a particular impact on particular people. And so you have to understand what will happen to these people. And these people are based in different countries. So different countries are affected differently by automation. Uh, try to make sense of this again here. This is a, this is a cool way of presenting data. Um, very beautiful, but it's very questionable. Um, in 
uh, its usefulness because actually even making this bigger does not necessarily make it easier to understand. You see that you have all these different colors and I'm not sure how the human eye is supposed to match the colors here with the colors there. This seems a, a very uh, futile exercise. Anyway, um, I tried to meditate on this for a while. Um, you will see, you, you can see some things. You can see some things because um, you can clearly see that there is this correlation between hourly wage and uh, the extent of automation, right? And this you can somehow see from this graph, even if you cannot identify the particular um, the particular uh, colors in this graphic. And, and here is another bubble graphic um, uh, and uh, similar. Uh, this talks about college degrees, um, jobs that are high paid and require a degree versus jobs that are low paid and uh, easily available without a degree, so like waiters and cashiers and retail sales on the right side, while on the left side we have, you know, cosmetologists, teachers, um, and the best paid physicians and chief executives and dentists, uh, which are very unlikely to be automated. Um, okay, so here is a, um, a little discussion of what we can learn from these diagrams. Uh, try to, you should be able to understand such a diagram, you should be able to say what it says about automation and jobs. And uh, also that we are not talking only about completely eliminating jobs, automation also can mean that we we have machines doing part of a job that was tedious or difficult but required humans. Now that we don't have automation, this part of the job is done by a machine. Sorry, now that we have automation, this part of the job is done by a machine. And Therefore, we will need less people. So again, this causes unemployment, right? So even partial automation causes unemployment. So what do we do now with this? What is the ethics of, of automation uh, and job loss? What is the politics? How can we regulate this? Um, first, of course, you have a geopolitical uh, consequence. Uh, jobs are distributed differently. Automation is distributed differently. Some countries are predominantly uh, agricultural places. Um, which surprisingly um, will have a lot of problems with automation because agriculture is one of the things that can be automated uh, relatively easily. Other places are primarily uh, offer primarily services, expertise, um, education. These places will be affected less, right? Um, and so we have a worldwide uh, balance or worldwide distribution of risks from automation, uh, which is unfortunate because uh, very often the poorer places are those that will uh, get the biggest problems uh, due to automation. So again, it's an example of how uh, the rich countries um, make sure that they themselves don't get the problems and they export them, you know, to the poorer countries, which already have many problems. Uh, automation doesn't seem to, to, to solve this, to make it better, uh, but rather to make it worse. Um, so this is one political aspect of automation, right? World politics of automation. Uh, and here you see, you know, Nepal, for example, a country that is not um, uh, famous for being particularly wealthy, uh, has 80% of jobs at risk. At risk, Ethiopia the same, 88, almost 90% of jobs at risk, meaning that only 10% of people, 12% of people, will still be employed uh, in a few decades. And what do we do with the rest? And it's not like Ethiopia uh, now has full employment, right? Um, China, uh, China of course, is wealthy enough to uh, probably deal with it to, to s some extent. Um, India is on the way there, uh, but El Salvador, you know, is another country that will probably not uh, be happy to lose 75% of their jobs. Um, the global average is 57, surprisingly, right? So. Um, Many of the bigger countries uh, obviously have much lower uh, averages uh, because, you know, they, they export services that cannot be automated. Okay, and uh, you see here particular cities, particular places uh, in the United States and jobs at loss. Uh, they are not much better off, uh, but of course they are better off, right? These are all under 50, while if you look internationally here, we are somewhere between 70 and 80 and 90, right? So this is already much less effect from automation. Um, 
And of course, here the effects on rich and poor. And uh, then you have um, this attempt to regulate technology. And how do we regulate technology? We have to think about techno regulation as a whole chapter of you know public policy. Uh, how can we regulate technology? And and also philosophy and also social sciences. You know how does this even work when we want to regulate something? Who regulates? And then we come to very uh, fundamental questions. For example, who? changes technology, who regulates technology in a society? Is technology something that we consciously um, regulate and then society says, okay, now we have a new technology, let's make some laws and direct it into one direction. If, if you have been, you know, alive in the past 10 years, um, you have seen how Facebook has developed, how Google has developed, how um, home surveillance has developed. And you are probably aware that this is not how it works, right? It's not like societies see what's coming and they try to make a plan as a society where we want to go. It's rather the other way. Uh, technology just explodes, does its thing, and then human societies have to try to somehow come to, to terms with it uh, after the fact. And uh, after everybody who was to profit from this had taken his share, right? And so uh, in, in the future, this means that we have to deal with that in this way, right? We have to be um, aware that um, um, technological developments are just going to fall upon us and then uh, we need to still have a society that is strong enough to try to make sense of it and regulate these, these forces. And uh, you can see examples of printing press, automobile, you know, all kinds of uh, previous technologies where you can study how this has happened. There's the idea of um, first of technological determinism, right, is the one theory. Technology does its own thing and doesn't care about human society. And a more um, um, benevolent approach, social constructivism, tries to argue that uh, perhaps humans uh, influence technology in that they take a part in the construction of, of technology. Um, and the actor network theory uh, postulates that we have whole networks of, of people and machines that together uh, form holes. And this is from Latour, right, who is, uh, we talked about previously, again, you should um, notice that, that there are these cross connections here. So Latour, Bruno Latour is the the philosopher behind the actor network theory is also the person behind the idea of um, you know artifacts, um, how they influence human actions and how they change the way we act. And this we talked about when we talked about um, the extended mind. Uh, so there's a connection between the philosophy of mind, the extended mind, the uh, extension of mental. Uh, properties or mental, mental, uh, how you say, uh, processes into artifacts, and uh, here uh, the actor network theory. Um, so uh, then we have this this whole area so so complex and so rich, uh, in, especially in uh, the study of the past and how technology developed in the past. Uh, that there's a whole area of science now called SDA, Science and Technology Studies, uh, or Science, Society, Technology and Society Studies. And these uh, studies, this STS, is a, is a kind of sociological study. It's not so much philosophy, it's more sociology or historical sociology uh, because it attempts to, um, in, in a big part, to reconstruct how technologies of the past established themselves and changed and from this tries to develop a model of how technology develops uh, that we can use to predict future developments. Um, the last chapter here is about the universal basic income. Uh, of course, having all this um, unemployment would re will require us to structure our societies differently. And uh, we have this idea that since robots take away jobs, uh, robots somehow have to contribute to um, the financial, to, to compensate the financial losses that come from the loss of the jobs. And therefore, robots that produce value should inject this value back into society, right? Uh, via taxation, for example. 
and uh, uh, there is a the idea of a universal basic income. Uh, people should just get a basic income, no matter whether they have work or not, because we can afford it. If robots do the jobs and produce all the income, then we can afford to not produce income and sit around, do nothing, and still get the money, right? Uh, this would be good, but of course it has some problems. So first you have to define precisely what is supposed to to be a universal basic income, how it's different from uh, you know other kinds of social benefits, uh, then you have to talk a little about um, the social, in general, the social effects of a basic income, which are much broader than what we uh, initially thought of as you know just compensating for the. Um, unemployment due to robots. Uh, we have, for example, it will have an effect on children. Young families will be more encouraged to make children because they have safety um, uh, or for their income and they're not afraid of the future, right? So all kinds of things will be better uh, with a universal basic income, but also it will cause problems like everything, right? Um, so it might make people, you know, be, who are already lazy be even lazier and less motivated to work. Um, uh, it might make it difficult for long-term unemployed people to find jobs and it might cause a crisis in the uh, psychological crisis to, to people because work is also one of, in our society, is one of the big sources of uh, personal worth and uh, self-confidence. Um, and people who don't have uh, this source of worth and self-confidence, long-term unemployed people, uh, normally have all sorts of psychological and social problems associated with the inability to find work. Right, so it's not only you know the, the where the money comes from. If if money rained from the sky, like essentially it would happen in a universal basic income scheme, uh, it would not solve these problems. Right, we still would need to find some thing to make us feel needed, make us feel worthy in our lives. This might be other things, not work. It might be artistic expression. It might be um, a, a more intensive family life, caring for children, educating children, homeschooling children, for example. More uh, would provide uh, jobs to, to people, uh, to parents, job replacements, right? So you suddenly become a teacher for your children. Um, but of course, this is only available to some parents, right? Parents who are educated enough to teach their children will be fine, perhaps. Uh, b b parents who are not able to do that uh, will still have a problem uh, finding a meaning in their lives if suddenly the 10 hours a day that previously were roughly associated with uh, their job, including um, you know eight hours of work plus some commuting, uh, if these fall away, then suddenly you have 10 hours of nothing. You have a black hole in your life that needs to be filled meaningfully. So um, then th these are some of the problems. Uh, then we discuss some UBI experiments and what came out of them and the idea of a robot tax. Um, again, all these are not really clear. Um, and um, there are all sorts of, um, of possible problems uh, associated with the robot tax. Okay, so this is one thing, this chapter about work. Now, um, we also talked about war robots and Arkin's ethical governor. Um, and this chapter here, if we look, uh, this is a general video now about this review. Uh, if we didn't talk about these things in your class or if you don't have the specific for this session, the specific lecture notes in your class, then you don't have to know this for the final exam, right? So I'm, I'm still giving you this here because I want to reuse this video for future classes where we have talked about this. So just, just use some sense, right? If you, if this is part of your class, then you will find the lecture notes for this chapter in your um, Moodle. If this is not part of your class, you don't find the lecture notes, then just leave it out. Okay. So war robots and Arkin's ethical governor. This is another big chapter, obviously. Uh, how do we deal with uh, war robots? The ethical governor, you need to understand what it is. Uh, you need to read the original paper to get the idea. I'm not going to repeat everything here, right? So we have uh, the goals of an ethical governor. We have two points we are talking about, mainly discrimination and proportionality. What do they mean? You have to be able to define them. Discrimination is an R is missing up there. Okay, proportionality. And uh, then about the morality of war. War is not, uh, you know, everybody beating everybody else. War is particular moral 
uh, rules associated with it. There is just war. There is good war. I mean, no war is good, but there is, you know, relatively among bads, a better war and worse war. Uh, as it is among crimes, right? There are better crimes and worse crimes. Stealing a pen is a crime, but uh, uh, it's not such a bad crime as, you know, killing someone and then taking away his pen. So there are, you know, various levels of crime. In the same way, uh, there are various, various levels of uh, war. Uh, war can be, uh, for example, a war where you defend your country against an external aggression, which is kind of, a, you know, justifiable war. Um, or war can be a completely um, savage, you know, falling over another country and then trying to eat it alive, like what uh, Germany did in the Second World War. Uh, and this then is a particularly immoral war. Right? So we have to distinguish all these um, justifications for war first, right? Is, is a war as a whole um, morally more or less justified? Although, again, of course, you can dispute that wars are justified at all, right? I, I completely uh, would agree with that, that there should be no wars at all. But since we are humans, it seems that we cannot avoid this. There have never been times without war. So um, uh, we better get used to it and try to, you know, um, at least regulate as much as we can. Uh, then, of course, inside a particular war, uh, whether it is a good war or a bad war, um, inside a particular war, you have particular actions of war and these acts of war can be more or less good morally um, so you can you know as part of a war you can kill civilians or rape people uh, or uh, you can treat your opponents uh, humanely and you can uh, observe all the international conventions uh, and try to bomb only military targets and try to avoid killing people and so on, right? Uh, destroying infrastructure instead of uh, human beings. And, and then your actions become relatively uh, better, right? Uh, although, again, not good. Um, and so all these moral distinctions in war we, we have to make sense of. And, and so now Arkin proposes a model of how this is going to work. And uh, he says we should install a, a governor, ethical governor uh, in a, a war robot. And this governor would observe um, that, you know, the robot behaves morally. And he gives a technical description, which we analyze a little here and try to understand. You should have a rough idea of how the ethical governor works. Uh, you see some code here. You don't need to, of course, to know all the details, but you should have a rough idea of how this thing is supposed to work. And now, of course, we have a, a load of criticism. Um, what is the problem here? You have uh, interest conflict in the deployment of this ethical governor. You have problems of democratic control of this. Um, you have translation problems uh, with Latour, right? Uh, like we talked about previously with Latour and Dreyfus. Um, you have Winograd's criticism, Dreyfus' criticism uh, in this translation chapter. Um, collective agency and goal translation, we already talked about that in the past with Latour, um, but here it is again. It's also useful to criticize this. Uh, we can criticize whether discrimination is at all uh, the morally relevant point. This has been also criticized. Um, and uh, we can ask what is morality at all, right? Because the ethical governor is a concept that comes from steam machines. Uh, we can ask, is a steam machine really a good model for what uh, morality is doing? And this is what is criticized here. We have problems with the laws of war and the rules of engagement. Uh, and finally, we have a more Kantian point about dissent and conscience and, and whether um, a machine really does anything moral, you know, even if it has an ethical governor, <clears throat> is it even acting in a way that is genuinely a morally uh, a good way of acting? Is it is it a moral agent at all? Right. Uh, and so that's it. Here we have lots of criticisms. You should be able to criticize the ethical governor um, in this way. Okay. So now, for the moment, we are finished. Uh, we will not talk about more in this chapter, in this video. Um, perhaps in, in future, when we have more chapters, I will add to this. Okay, so thank you, and see you next time.